Hello and welcome to another one of my videos looking at our coursework unit. So we're looking at anti-Semitism in Germany and whether the anti-Semitism amongst the German people is an anomaly in the Nazi period. Now, as part of your coursework, you have to refer to the work of two historians. And in doing this, you need to assess their arguments and you also need to assess the context they produced and if there's any limitations that are brought about by this. So we, we generally use these two historians for our question on anti-Semitism, Browning and Goldhagen. They're very closely connected because Goldhagen's work is a reaction to Browning. So I'm going to look at those in a bit of detail today. So Browning's book, Ordinary Men, Reserve, Police Battalion 101 and the Final Solution in Poland, and it was published in 1992. Now, Browning is a renowned expert on the Holocaust. And this book is a study of a German police battalion of 500 men uh, that was uh, sat in reserve and it was called up uh, and sent to Poland to round up Jews and send them to the Nazi death camps. And it was also instructed to take part in uh, a number of massacres of Jew mainly Jewish people in Poland. So it, a lot of this stuff is very, very grim. It's looking at, at a mass murder. Um, this battalion carries out some horrendous crimes during the, during the war and as part of the Holocaust. The men that are focused on are from Hamburg. Uh, they are from working class backgrounds. Um, they've been fit, found to be unfit for either medical or other reasons for military duty, which is why they were put in a, a police reserve battalion instead. They were largely in the, the kind of early middle age. They were kind of late 30s, early 40s. And they were said to have no real affiliation to the Nazi party. In fact, some of them were, were seen as, as being quite opposed to the Nazi party. So Browning was exploring why these ordinary men uh, would commit such terrible acts. Uh, and this offers insight to our question is whether there's an anomaly or, or not, because it gives in, us insight into whether anti-Semitic action were part of a long term trend or due to the Nazi regime. So because we're looking at the views of ordinary Germans, a book about ordinary men would seem to be a really good starting point. Right, so Browning's argument. So he argues that the men carried out these horrendous anti-Semitic acts, um, including the mass shootings and mass murders, for two key reasons. The first is to do with compliance. So he argues that these men simply were following orders and that it, it is inherent or natural for people to, to accept and comply with orders from those in authority, even if they know those orders uh, are wrong or damaging to others. And he based a lot of his theory on the work of Milgram, a, a famous psychologist who carried out experiments on compliance. In Milgram's experiments, uh, there was an actor who was wired up um, to uh, an electric device and the, the people who were um, part of the study would be brought in and would have to uh, ask that actor questions. They didn't know they were an actor and if they got that that I got a question wrong, then they would have to administer an electric shock to the actor. Now, the more questions the actor got wrong, then the higher the level of electric shock uh, the participants in the trial would give them. And what Milgram found was that a startling number of them were willing to, uh, to give electric shocks, which would clearly seemingly hurt the actor because they would uh, display uh, extreme forms uh, of pain uh, and would beg for the person to stop. And actually, a, a number of people were willing to uh, administer doses of electricity or, or shock levels that would have been fatal um, to people. So these people would simply been told by a, ma a man in a lab coat with a clipboard that the experiment required for them to continue. And they did. So if you then put this into the context of World War II and that kind of Nazi leadership uh, telling people to do things, you can see why they might, according to Browning, have felt compelled that they had to do so. Now, what Browning says is that there is evidence that the men were told that they wouldn't come to any harm if they, they refused to, to follow orders or, or wouldn't take part in the shootings. And, but actually, there was only 12 of the 500 men that refused. A couple were to do with um, with them having children, they didn't want to shoot children. Uh, and there was even evidence of one of the men who refused to take part actually going, going back to Germany and even being promoted. So 
the the traditional argument really that it was absolute fear of what would happen to them it's maybe not completely what Browning is, is relying on. What he's saying is there is something about human psychology about complying with orders. So even though these men were old enough to know better because they they were, had been adult pre-Nazi uh, period, and even though they were not necessarily Nazi supporters, they still felt compelled to follow those orders. Now, the other bit that Browning talks about is really interesting is this idea of, pressure, of, of peer pressure. So Browning argues that the second reason they carried out the shooting is they didn't want to appear weak in front of their, their comrades by formally backing out of the mass shootings. And he talks about how people might try and sort of avoid taking part in, in more subtle ways and kind of disappearing off at the, uh, the, the right moment or taking up guard duty or something like that to try and avoid it. But actually formally saying, I don't want to do it. They really would, would be worried about feeling uh, appearing weak in front of their comrades. It also, also likely that they would have believed that backing out was fruitless. Um, there was not only the, B, the police battalion, but also local volunteers. And the, the fact of the matter would have been that the, these, these people were going to get shot anyway. Uh, and a lot of the, the members of the battalion kind of reported this, that it would have been fruitless to, to, to do anything. And also that by backing out, they would have placed a greater burden uh, on their colleagues who would have who would have had to do done even more killing. Rather interestingly, Browning doesn't think anti-Semitic propaganda plays a major role in terms of dehumanization of, of, of the Jewish victims. Uh, and and again, that that propaganda probably wouldn't have had a big impact on this particular demographic anyway. Browning's argument suggests that anti-Semitic actions of these men was an anomaly because they would they would not have willingly harmed or killed Jewish people without the uh, the Nazi orders and without the context of them as being a battalion that's assigned to do this during the war. So their actions definitely appear to be uh, an anomaly. You know, you could argue there's even a suggestion of, of a lack of anomaly in terms of belief because it, it seems to suggest that these men weren't particularly anti-Semitic beforehand and remain to be not particularly anti-Semitic whilst doing it. Now, this is a, an argument which has uh, been criticised, and we'll look at some of those criticisms shortly. Right, so the context and limitations of Browning's argument. Uh, and this is one of the things you need to write about with both historians. So you, you'll write a paragraph explaining their view, and you'll write a paragraph uh, looking at context and limitations, and also you'll refer to uh, their writings later on. Obviously, it's really important that you go above and beyond just watching this video and you actually engage with the real text of uh, Browning and then Goldhagen and we're going to look at in a minute. So Browning is a, a renowned uh, historian. He's known for his expertise on the Holocaust and on, on the Nazi regime. He's a professor of history at the University of North Carolina. Uh, and he wrote this book in 92 and he'd been writing about the Holocaust and the Nazis since the 1970s. So this isn't someone who's new to the topic isn't somebody who isn't an expert on the topic. This, this guy is, is a proper expert on this area. Um, Ordinary Men was uh, originated from a, a commission by uh, Vadi Hashem, uh, the Israeli Holocaust uh, Museum. Uh, Browning also was a, um, a key expert in, in a really significant trial when it comes to Holocaust history. Uh, David Irving, who was an absolutely vile and notorious Holocaust denier, had so uh, had tried to sue Penguin um, Books and a uh, historian uh, called Libstadt um, for libel for attacking his work. Now, obviously, this is not a trial that the um, the, the history community can afford uh, to lose. And Browning is brought in as one of the, the key uh, expert witnesses to destroy the arguments of Irving and to uh, prevent his suit uh, for libel being successful. And so he played a really important role in, in defeating Irving in this trial. Now, in terms of the kind of branding, it, again, in his, his life experience, the politically fraught position in America in the, the 1960s and 19. Um, the 70s with the uh, the civil rights movement, Vietnam Watergate scandal, uh, and one of the things that this made him interested in was understanding why otherwise seemingly very good people could commit um, terrible things and act in bad ways, and so we can see the context into what he's looking at and why he's looking at it. <clears throat> now, one of the potential limitations is his work focuses on the Nazi era, and therefore not fully addressing the time frame of your question. 
so it, it will tell you why the people are ordinary people acted at the time so it would be really useful now the fact that those ordinary people don't seemingly don't have him uh, aren't imbued with don't hold really strongly anti-semitic views according to Browning could all Browning could also be um, significant uh, for your arguments right now the second historian is Daniel Goldhagen now so Daniel Goldhagen's book is called Hitler's willing executioners ordinary Germans and the Holocaust so again we've got ordinary Germans in the title so we can see immediately this is going to help us address our our question and there's a big clue in that title with that first phrase in it as well Hitler's willing executioners so this is going to suggest that the German people were acting willingly happily in terms of their actions as perpetrators in the Holocaust the book was written as a direct response to Browning's ordinary men um, Goldhagen was really angry at Browning's claims uh, about essentially these killings taking place without overt anti-semitism amongst the perpetrators who were doing it and Browning he felt Browning's uh, arguments needed to be refuted they needed to be disproved now he he believed that anti-semitism in German culture had been there for a very very long time and uh, so his book does focus on that broader context of German history rather than just the events of the Holocaust because what he wants to prove is that this is part of a long-term trend in German history so he's very much going to be arguing against the idea of anomaly now the book was highly controversial has been uh, Goldhung has been accused of anti-German racism by some uh, and the judgment of academic uh, historians has been particularly damning on his work that doesn't mean it hasn't sold in large numbers that it hasn't won prizes and hasn't been a commercial success so Goldhagen's argument is, is, is based around this idea of what he refers to as eliminationist anti-Semitism. And that is that the German people aren't just anti-Semitic, they're anti-Semitic to the extent that they want to kill Europe's Jews. And he says that this has been ingrained in German culture for a very, very long time. So therefore, there is definitively no anomaly in terms of the Nazis and the actions of the German people in the Holocaust. He argues that not only did the German people know about the Holocaust, an area which is, is still one of historical debate with some historians disagreeing on the extent to which the German people did or didn't know about the Holocaust. But he argues that they, all, that they not only knew about it, they wholeheartedly support it. Uh, those Germans who perpetrated the Holocaust, he says, did so willingly, hence the title Hitler's Willing Executioners. He then takes this even further, says they were not ashamed of their actions, but rather celebrated them and boasted about them. And if you read Goldhagen or extracts of Goldhagen, one of the things you'll, you'll find is they, it, it talks about um, perpetrators celebrating, um, celebrating their actions, uh, writing home, telling people what they'd done. Um, holding banquets and, and and writing poetry and keeping tallies about the number of people they killed so some really really horrendous stuff now a lot of other historians have, uh, have put this to one side and said well essentially you're going to find with for better ones of words psychopaths within all societies and therefore the, these people are given an outlet during the war and just because some people took, seem to take a degree of enjoyment from their doing doesn't necessarily mean everybody else did but Goldhagen does go as far as saying but well, look they all wanted to do it they all enjoyed doing it and they go beyond their orders so they killed Jews without orders they even killed Jews against orders when they were told not to kill them they still killed them um, and he even goes beyond the perpetrators and said those who those who weren't perpetrators of the Holocaust that those who were left at home those who weren't taking part they, they would also have taken the place of the people perpetrating the Holocaust and they would have done so willingly. They would have carried out the same atrocity. So it's not just that group of men who carried it out that, that wanted to do it. It was the whole of German society. And in this, many, many people have thought his view to be very, very extreme. Right. Now, it... Goldhagen looks at evidence of pre-existing pre anti-Semitism and goes to argue that, that it was always eliminationist. So he explains away the lack of kind of earlier anti-Semitic action by the German people in terms of them being restrained by either governments or other social norms uh, and ideas at the time. Uh, and he argues that, that Hitler, rather than kind of 
in sh making the making it happen the holocaust he argues that he simply unleashes the anti-semitism of the german people and says that it's acceptable to express that it's success it's acceptable to work on it and so he's not forcing them to act against the jews again a highly controversial argument he also his argument also suggests that Nazi propaganda was essentially unnecessary. The, the, the German people were already eliminationist anti-Semites. They didn't need convincing by Nazi propaganda uh, that, that these things were at, were needed. He also talks about the long-term anti-Semitism amongst the Catholic Church. Um, he he argues that and he focuses a lot on Battalion 101, just like um, Browning does. And he says they actually acted differently towards the Jews than they did to non-Jews, and and that is disputed by Browning and other historians. Um, and he also argues that the German people um, acted in a way that other people wouldn't have. So he says that the Italians didn't and wouldn't act like the Germans did. The Danes didn't and wouldn't act um, like the German people did. Uh, and so he sees this as a uniquely German phenomenon. And a lot of historic, a lot of Holocaust historians have really disputed this, and they talked about the much stronger elements of anti-Semitism in um, the histories and cultures of other countries involved in what was happening, particularly uh, some of the countries in Eastern Europe. So some context uh, on Goldhagen, some limitations. Uh, he's the son of Eric Goldhagen, a Harvard professor uh, and an, a Holocaust survivor. And so there's, there's definitely a, a family connection um, uh, to, to the issue that he's writing about and the reason why he would be so, uh, so interested and so passionate about it. He was an assistant professor of government and social studies department at Harvard. Uh, his book, the, the Hitler's Willing Executioners, is then accepted as a doctoral thesis and he is he, turned into a PhD at Harvard. So he's a guy who's, a, who's highly uh, academic, uh, but whose background is not necessarily um, got the same kind of length of time or uh, the same kind of recognition in the field of history of that of Browning. So his work is highly controversial. And you really need to, to, to look into that. He, he's seen as being anti-German. Um, however, that's not to say that his work wasn't uh, widely read and received uh, relatively well on a tour of Germany. Um, he also received several awards, both in Germany and elsewhere. It's the really kind of academic historians who have been particularly uh, critical of his work, stating he, he ignored any research, um, any documents or any events that didn't match his argument. Um, that his work was overly emotional and his methods were highly dubious. And some of them have gone as far as to say that he, that Goldhagen had a, a very limited understanding of, of the source material and no understanding of some elements uh, of the source material at all. Probably the, the, the strongest condemnation of it, his work it comes from um, Raoul Hilberg, who um, wrote on the Holocaust, again, another renowned expert on the Holocaust, who wrote about the destruction of the European Jews. Uh, and he states that Goldhagen is totally wrong about everything, totally wrong, exceptionally wrong. Uh, and really, that's quite a, a condemning um, argument about uh, Goldhagen's arguments. But again, it's something you need to look into and make up your own mind. So this should give you a bit of an overview. There's uh, other um, good uh, videos and things on, on the internet about um, these two uh, theories and their arguments, which you, you can go and look at those as well. But the absolute key bit for you all is actually going to be ultimately getting hold of excerpts and chapters from Browning and Goldhagen's book and looking at those yourself and thinking about how your arguments will fit with theirs and how you, how you will use them in answering your question and also doing some further research into the context in which they wrote and their limitations. Right, I hope this has been useful for you. Uh, please remember uh, to like, to subscribe uh, and uh, to leave me any comments and to um, continue using this series of videos to help you, um, particularly over the summer holidays, looking at your coursework and then again when we come back in September uh, to help you uh, help support you and make sure you don't get lost amongst it all and you can find your way back to what you need to be doing. Right, thank you very much and I'll speak to you all again soon.